It's going, is it? Yeah. It's scary. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, uh, thank you. Thank you to the uh, Keston Centre. Uh, Sarah, <coughs> Maurice, I don't know where Maurice is. Maurice and uh, Janice uh, in particular. Uh, I think it's my third time actually speaking at a Keston event, so um, I'm, I feel part of the privilege. And it is always a privilege to represent my work, uh, and there is a distinct privilege to represent in a public forum like this. So thank you to all of you to, uh, for coming in today. Now, when we think about money politics, and we think about money politics and its regulation, it is clear that it's actually quite high on the political agenda. Uh, in fact, the uh, agreement that the Australian Labour Party struck with both the Independents and the Greens makes specific mention of regulation of political funding, or more accurately, reform of political finance. And indeed, a fortnight ago, um, uh, fruits, the first fruits in terms of that particular agreement was tabled in terms of federal parliament, where you had a bill that, if adopted, would actually considerably increase the transparency of political funding in Australia. And not just federally. Uh, in fact, we saw last week the most comprehensive package to date uh, being proposed in Australia, where in the New South Wales Parliament, there's currently a bill that provides for an integrated package of caps on political spending, caps on political donations, and also a reconfigured <coughs> funding scheme. Now, despite being quite high on the political agenda, these issues, money politics and regulation, are not typically seen as human rights issues. There are very few human rights organizations that actually campaign on the question of political money. There are notable exceptions. There's the Public Interest Advocacy Center in New South Wales, and of course, Get Up, uh, of course, which is based in Sydney. But even then, when campaigning on this particular topic, questions surrounding money politics are not typically understood or not typically perceived as questions for human rights. And as against this background, then I'm going to make the central contention of my lecture. And the central contention is that money politics as issues fall squarely within the human rights agenda. And the three strands to my claim, I say that money politics and its regulation fall squarely within the human rights agenda, firstly because the progressive advancement of the human rights agenda is likely to only eventuate through a democratic political process. And insofar as money politics threatens the democratic integrity of the political process, it also threatens the progressive realization of the human rights agenda. The second strand is that money politics raises challenging questions for human rights organizations both in terms of how they're funded and also in terms of how they use money to influence the political process. And the third strand is that money politics implicates specific freedoms and rights. In particular, freedom of political association and freedom of political expression. And in my lecture, I'm going to focus on freedom of political expression. So if you like, coming to the title of my Lecture, Money Politics, Why It Matters to Human Rights. I'm going to be arguing for three levels of significance. Money politics is significant in terms of human rights agenda more broadly, it's significant to human rights organizations more specifically, and it's also significant in terms of specific rights and specific freedoms. <coughs> now, let me come to my first argument through a real life example. In Lida, to the uh, recent federal election, we've witnessed a major ad campaign by the mining companies. Hundred million dollars they put aside to campaign against the ALP's <coughs> super profits tax. And as you all will be aware, the debate surrounding the mining super profits tax dominated the public agenda for weeks. And we've had sort of high point in terms of the corporate power of mining companies, when they issued a two-week ultimatum to the newly formed Gillard Labour government, a two-week ultimatum that said to the government that if you did not reach a deal that was satisfactory to the mining companies or the mining super profits tax, 
they therefore threaten if the deal was not reached, the ads would be resumed. Now, if anybody had any doubt about the corporate power or the financial power of money companies, I think that high point really puts it to rest. Now, contrast and absence. And the absence is the recommendations of the Brennan Inquiry into the protection of human rights. And as many of you would have been aware, one of the key recommendations of the Brennan Inquiry was an adoption of a Human Rights Act with parliamentary scrutiny and what's called reform judicial review. Notably absent in terms of public debate. And if human rights organizations like GetUp and others had some of the money the mining companies had, maybe just a little portion of that, I suspect the outcome will be quite different. Now what points can we draw from this brief anecdote? I think there are three points. One is that the human rights agenda or its progress has to take place through the political system. It is through the political process that we have human rights issues on the public agenda and particular measures are adopted in terms of protecting human rights. The second point is this. The political space or the public realm, as John Rawls would describe it, is a finite space. It's a limited space. And what follows from the second point is the third point. Is that it is money politics or practices surrounding money politics that allows the wealthy to unfairly influence the political process through the use of their wealth, will see them crowding out issues that are seen to be important, of importance to less resource organizations. And those less resource organizations would include many, if not all, of the human rights organizations. And really what the upshot of all those three points are is that unfairness in the truth in the political process as a result of money politics, threatens the progressive realization of the human rights agenda. Now, I use the word progressive in two senses here. Uh, I use it firstly, progressive in the sense of it eventual, and that's how I'm using it in terms of the arguments I just made a few moments ago. But one can also understand progressive with a, in an ideological sense, or progressive in terms of the meaning meanings of the human rights agenda. And the starting point here is that the meanings and conceptions of human rights is highly contested. Even in this room, we all disagree on what particular human rights mean, and I'm sure we all also disagree as to what particular measures are best, most effective in advancing the human rights agenda. Now, if we've got what I consider to be fact, that these are contested matters, then what we should be aiming for in terms of political processes are political processes that produce meanings or human rights agenda that best advances groups that are seen to be at the heart of the human rights agenda. That is, the disadvantaged and the disenfranchised. And if you take that as a premise, that we should have political processes that allow the interests and the views of the disenfranchised and the disadvantaged to be better articulated, then you can see then how money politics, by giving an unfair advantage to the wealthy, not only threatens the progressive realization of human rights agenda in terms of its eventual advancement, but also threatens the progressive advancement of human rights agenda in terms of the meanings that can be given to that particular agenda. <coughs> Let me come to my second strand of my argument. The second strand of my argument, you recall, is the importance of money politics to how human rights organizations are funded and how they actually use money to influence the political process. Now, let me approach it through a hypothetical scenario. Imagine we had a non-government organization by the name of Human Rights Now. And that for this particular organization, the central aim of the organization was in fact 
the enactment of a human rights act as recommended by the Benin Inquiry. And imagine that this particular organization, Human Rights Now, actually has a multi-million dollar budget. And in fact, its budget, in fact, is greater than the budgets of the major parties. And it engages in a massive ad campaign, and it's a hugely successful ad campaign. And so successful that, in fact, the ALP government, which is narrowly elected, attributes at least a key factor for its re-election to the campaign by Human Rights Now, and also the commitment by the ALP to enact the Human Rights Act. Should we celebrate or regret this development? It's a hypothetical scenario. Well, it seems to be, when we think about that particular question, the starting point must be that human rights organizations, like any other organizations that participate through the political process, mining companies, trade unions, business groups, should be subject to the same democratic principles. And if we accept they should be subject to the same democratic principles, then they too should be subject to the principle of fairness in the political process. And this hypothetical scenario, where we have a multi-million dollar ad campaign for a particular cause, just like the mining companies, also will crowd out issues that are important to this nation. So think, for example, I mean, the lead up to the uh, recent federal election, uh, Professor Ross Garneau lamented yeah, what he saw to be one of the most important challenges facing this country, what he saw as a productivity, productivity crisis in terms of the business sector and in terms of labor productivity. Those issues are possibly crowded out. Then you say to me, perhaps, come on, maybe, maybe there's a sleight of hand here. Or not so fast, you say. You say, maybe it's unfair, but perhaps, even if it's unfair, can't we at least concede that it actually advances the human rights agenda? That, in fact, what we are confronted with this hypothetical scenario is a bit of a trade-off. We've got unfairness, but hey, human rights gets a boost through the enactment of the Human Rights Act. But that is far from it. Now, recall what I said a few months ago. The meanings of human rights are contested, and so are the measures as to what best advances the human rights agenda. While human rights now, this hypothetical, scenario, uh, hypothetical organization, might be might, it's of a strong view that the Human Rights Act best advances the protection of human rights, there might be people like myself who are committed to a human rights perspective but actually opposed to judicial review as a key measure for protecting human rights. Or there might be others from a different perspective that believe in the Constitutional Bill of Rights who have a strong view that a human rights act that provides a what called weak form judicial review or the dialogue model of the Bill of Rights, that that weak form is simply just that, weak. Now, what about the fact, not fact, sorry, in that hypothetical scenario, what about this non-government organization of spending political parties? <coughs> you know, having an ad budget that's actually superior and one could imagine a situation, maybe George Soros handed over $100 million or so to Human Rights Now, as he handed over to Human Rights Watch in America. What about that? How do we view it? Is this proper? Is this legitimate? Now, it seems to me, if that happens, as with the mining companies, that development is of dubious legitimacy. My strong view is that with elections, elections should be centered upon their contestants. It should be centered upon those seeking public office that are candidates and the political parties. Now the reasons are simple. 
the functions of the function, the central function of elections is to elect. And what follows from that central function is this: is that the contestants are subject to a form of accountability that does not apply to non-government organizations or what in electoral law jargon are called third parties. And that accountability is voter accountability. Third parties are neither voted in nor voted out. Yes, they may influence, and in fact have an important role in influencing the election process, but they do not have the same role as the contestants. When you think about this, and what I'm saying, it's clear that I don't view all political associations in the same light. It's clear from what I'm saying that it's all my strong view that political parties enjoy a privileged role during election, election time because of the function of elections. And it's very crucial to remember here that no one is good cause to be critical of the practices of political parties, especially the major parties. <coughs> They do perform functions that are not performed by any other type of organization, specifically third parties. And let me focus here on the major parties, because as I said, it's good cause to be critical of their practices, but one must not lose sight of how vital they are to the democratic life of Australia. Major parties have functions, for example, in bridging local citizenship with national citizenship, they also have a function of being, ideally, being inclusive and integrated, in the sense that, ideally, they should be uh, having an agenda that actually deals with a range of issues, and it will seek to actually craft that range of issues into a party platform. And ideally, all that should be crafted and presented as a national agenda, as an agenda for governing this nation. And when you understand those functions, and those functions that are distinctive to political parties, can perhaps agree with what American political philosopher Nancy O. Rosenblum said, that with the major political parties, they enjoy, to quote, a unique nominative status. Now, of course, third parties or non-government organizations like it up play an important and a vital role in terms of election campaigns. And they play a very vital role in terms of representing the views of certain parts of the citizenry. So much is true. So much is true. But even here, I think, there's cause for more careful scrutiny. Now, get up, for example, last I checked on the 28th of October 2010, there's a website, says that it's got 400 more than 400,000 members, yeah? More than 400,000 members. And this, this is quite a dramatic increase, yeah? I mean, in terms of the annual report and so on and so forth, at the end of the 2006 financial year, it was about 100,000 members or so. So we see a quadrupling, yeah? From 2006 to the present time. <coughs> There's an important question to be asked here. What does it mean to be a member of Get Up? Now, I think I'm a member. I think I'm a member because I went to the link that says join up. And I click onto the link that fill in my details. And I think I'm a member because after I did all that, I received emails yeah, from GetUp. But note here that I don't have formal membership rights. Now, GetUp, as far as I can tell, and Sam can correct me if I'm wrong, is a company. Yeah? It's a company, and it's got a board of directors. I don't have the right to actually formally vote for the board of directors. And as a member in the commerce, I can't formally influence the campaign priorities or campaign strategies of the And these are uncontroversial membership rights, are they not? Yes? When we think about joining a trade union, for example, we think about joining various other organizations, these are membership rights that are treated, are taken for granted. Now, it is the case that being a member of GetUp in this sense is bereft of these membership rights, the rights that traditionally associated with membership of, uh, membership 
of public organizations, then doesn't this dilute the claim, whether made implicitly or not, by get up, that it represents the views of these hundreds and thousands of members. So I agree. I agree with Tony Abbott when he talks about political finance, and he says that when we look at political finance and its regulation, we must look at organizations like get up. And I think that particular point is of heightened significance as organizations grow larger or more successful like get up, and therefore have a much more significant role in terms of political process. And one can just get a sense in terms of get up significance, yeah? Just by looking at the amount of money and the amount of spending, political money and political spending it uh, actually receives and spends. So take, for example, the 2007-2008 financial year. So that's the financial year of the 2007 federal election. Figures are not out for the last federal election, and we won't get them for a few years. Yeah? This is one of the shameful things in terms of our current system. So we look at the, the federal, uh, federal election before. Get up received more than $2 million. Around four times, yeah? Around four times of what it received in 2005-2006. In fact, with quite a number of large donations, I like said large meaning donations, more than $10,000, with the biggest amount, anything in $2,500. It spent $1.28 million. And again, yeah, you can still chart this in terms of the success and the growth in size of Get Up which was, in fact, more than three times what is spent in 2005-2006. So I think that's good cause, yeah? And it's crucial that we actually have private scrutiny with other political parties to third parties, whether it be mining companies or organizations like that. Let me come to the third strand of my argument. And the third strand of my argument, recall, is that Money politics is a regulation important to human rights because it implicates specific freedoms and specific rights. And let me come to that particular argument through the question of spending limits. So these are limits on political spending by political parties and candidates and third parties. So in fact, these are the limits that we're actually seeing in this New South Wales bill that I mentioned in the very in introductory remarks of my lecture. I'm a strong advocate of spending limits. I'm a strong advocate for spending, of spending limits for two reasons. Firstly, there's a corruption rationale. It's a corruption rationale because what we're witnessing in Australia, in terms of the major parties, is that they're engaged in unsavory fundraising practices. And many of you would have read, read reports of this, where basically you have the ALP, Liberal Party, peddling influence, selling access to ministers, thousands of dollars where a businessman uh, could actually sit next to the Premier or a favorite minister, so on and so forth. And uh, one of the main drivers, if not the key driver of these unsavory fundraising practices is in fact an intensifying arms race between the major parties. It's the demand for funds that's driving the supply for funds. That's the anti-corruption rationale. There's also the fairness rationale. Yeah? Spending limits are an effective way to actually level the playing field somewhat. While the wealthy may remain wealthy, spending limits actually prevents them from excessively using their wealth to influence the political process. And recall again what I said to you a few months ago. The political space is a finite space. Now when you think about spending limits, they of course implicate freedom of political expression. They implicate them in principle, and under our Australian constitution, they also implicate the implied freedom of political communication. Now how then? Given that spending limits implicate the freedom of political uh, expression, both in principle and in constitutional terms, how then do we try to think about this through a rights framework? Now, one way, and perhaps maybe uh, it might be an instinctive way to think about this, is to say, well, okay, spending limits, they, uh, they represent a restriction on political expression, but we might see them to be justified. 
or the fact seem to be demonstrably justified in a free democratic society because they prevent corruption or because they promote fairness in the political process. So that's one way you could see that. And I think there's a lot to be said for that particular way of saying spending limits. But it's also a parallel way to view spending limits. When we think about spending limits, and we think about the freedom of political expression, now what spending limits do is that they restrict the formal freedom of certain parts of society. They basically restrict the freedom from regulation of the wealthier parties and the wealthier candidates and the wealthier parties. But while they might restrict the freedom from, they actually enhance the freedom to. That is the actual ability of political parties, candidates and third parties to engage in political expression. It's by limiting the excessive use of money that what we, we can, or can see or witness or we hope for is that those who are less resourced have a more effective ability to engage in political speech. So we have a paradox, do we not, with this second way of approaching spending limits. The paradox is that while you restrict certain types of freedom, the end result might be to enhance freedom more generally. Let me come to my concluding comments. When I started writing this stuff, or thinking about this, and I thought, oh, listen, in some ways I thought the arguments were reasonably obvious. And I thought, in fact, boy, I might run the risk of being quite renowned here, stating things that are reasonably obvious. But I suspect that my arguments, my comments, might prove to be a little controversial. <laughs> then I started thinking, why would they prove to be a little bit, if not a little bit more controversial? Why, perhaps, these arguments that seem to me, in fact, quite reasonably straightforward, <coughs> Why do they have a stronger currency? Why are they not more prevailing? Let me speculate. Let me speculate as to two possible reasons. One is that one possible set of reasons, and this really comes to the second strand of my argument, that how money politics and its regulation poses challenging questions for human rights organizations in terms of how they're funded, and the way they will use money to influence the political process. Now, quite possibly, what we in fact see in terms of why that might not be so readily accepted is the prevalence of instrumental reasoning amongst human rights organizations. And what I mean by instrumental reasoning is basically a form of reasoning that focuses on the outcomes and the results and generally neglects either the ethical questions or the morality of the means or the processes used to achieve those results. Now, if that's the case, if what I'm speculating is correct, then we have to ask the question. The question is this. If instrumental reasoning prevails or predominates amongst human rights organizations, how is the logic of that position any different from the position of Graham Richardson, former Hawk and Keating minister, and current commercial lobbyist. His position where he had emblazoned as a title of his book, whatever it takes. The second second reason is this. My arguments posit a close and positive relationship between human rights on one hand and democratic commitments. Well, it's clear to me that amongst human rights organizations and around the human rights movement, there's a strong current that actually posits an uneasy and at times even hostile relationship between human rights and democratic commitments. And it seems to me that one of the most often ways this is manifested is through the resort to that shorthand tyranny of the majority. And we've heard that story before, haven't we? Yeah? 
Human rights are vulnerable, they're precarious, because one key reason, perhaps even the principal reason, is that they might be actually undermined or, or uh, seized by an overbearing majority. Now it seems to me that a shorthand tyranny of majority is a hypo at times is a hypothesis that's been elevated to sacred truth. And let me give you two examples to illustrate my point. Take the case of asylum seekers. Perhaps some of us will see it as an example of the the majority. But if we go back to the Tocqueville, we go back to John Stuart Mill, we go back to James Madison, and consider carefully what they said about the tyranny of the majority. The danger they were alerting us to was the risk of a majority of citizens oppressing a minority of citizens. They said nothing or very little as the oppression of non-citizens like the asylum seekers. Now, I'm not saying they're not important issues of justice or rights in relation to asylum seekers. Of course they are. Or in other groups of non-citizens, whether it be permanent migrants or temporary migrants. Of course they are. But they're deeply understood and deeply appreciated through that shorthand tyranny of the majority. Another example. Counter-terrorism laws. Now again, that might seem like a strong candidate for vindicating uh, that shorthand to the majority. We have with these laws, excessive laws that are directed to a minority of citizens who just so happen to be Muslim. Now, what the shorthand to the majority might get the victims of the injustice correct, the minority of citizens, it fails to accurately identify the agents the principal agents in terms of the counterterrorism laws. Now, the principal agents in terms of counterterrorism laws is not an amorphous majority, and it's simply not an amorphous majority because this area is shrouded with secrecy. The majority do not know most of what actually happens in terms of this particular area of counterterrorism laws. And in fact, what are the principal agents in this particular area? and I've argued this elsewhere, is a powerful minority. What I've dubbed the National Security Executive. And that includes the political executive as well as the various security and, and, uh, security and police agencies. And often, with very, very loose accountability mechanisms, mechanisms that will actually tie them to the discipline of the lecture. And it seems to me, in this particular area, it vindicates the observation political scientist Robert Dow made decades ago, that in a representative system, while we must be vigilant against the tyranny of the majority, far more likely are we going to find the tyranny of powerful minorities. Let me conclude. It seems to me that if we had a human rights movement of human rights organizations that were more conscious as to the means of advancing the human rights agenda and more open to a positive relationship between human rights and democracy, it would seem to me that the relevance of money politics and its regulation to the human rights agenda will be reasonably clear. Thank you. speak after you as well, it takes um, uh, a lot of confidence to um, give a speech and then invite somebody to commentate on it, um, especially when you know that they disagree with you on a number of fronts. And so <laughs> I do disagree with, with Dr. Tan on a number of fronts, uh, but I think 
we agree on, on a number of things as well, and, and I'll kind of outline some of them as we go along. Um, the first thing I said is that it is extremely exciting times um, to be working in if you care about um, reforming political donations and reforming our, um, the way our democracy works. Um, as Dr. Tam said, this is a parliament which has put uh, political donations reform right at the top of the agenda um, as one of the very first um, fundamental points of agreement with the independence reform government. Um, it's also, however, a very challenging time because uh, because that agreement doesn't go very far. It focuses on transparency. Um, Dr. Tam has a picture of a brown paper bag on the cover of his book, um, which is always associated with with, um, with donations. Um, but transparency really means that we, we go from having a brown paper bag to having uh, a clear plastic Ziploc bag um, for political donations, which can be left around the Parliament House. Um, and so for those of us who really care about reforming um, and changing the influence that the money has on politics, um, there's a hell of a lot more work to be done to make sure that we don't see this opportunity wasted on mere transparency reforms that mean that we can see who is unduly influencing our politicians, um, but not actually stop that undue influence from happening. Um, I should disclose at this point that um, I have for several years made my living on political donations. I, my salary is paid entirely by political donations from members of GetUp. Um, and in fact, today GetUp uh, has solicited about $100,000 of political donations um, to put a new TV out on it. And that's something that I'm very, very proud of because the, those donations come from members of the Australian public who are passionate about an issue and have donated most of the small amounts of $50 or less to to make their voice heard in a communal way. I think that political donations is, uh, can be a really, really exciting uh, influence on our democracy as well as a corrupting one uh, if it's used in the right way. Um, I'll get on to some, some kind of more cerebral points in a second, particularly about, about how we go about reforming donations and about spending caps and, and so forth. But um, Dr. Tam addressed raised some really interesting points about that, which I should probably clear up uh, first. Uh, Firstly, that you know, raises uh, a lot of a lot of money, a lot of political donations, and spends a lot of money on elections. And this is this is true. Um, it's true also that um, under the current laws, uh, we don't have to disclose uh, how much we spent in the last federal election or how much we received for the last federal election or during the last federal election until February of 2012. Um, by which stage, uh, one would hope that everyone will thoroughly have lost interest. Um, however. Um, I can tell you that next week we're launching a, a, a transparency page on our website which will disclose all of our donations within 30 days of receipt um, if they're over the, um, the limit, which is currently $10,000, oh, no, it's $11,200 at the moment, um, whereas usually they'll be disclosed in, in 2012. Um, and we'll also be showing a real-time counter of how many donations and how much we receive in donations um, because it's something that we're actually extremely proud of. Um, I can give you a preview of, of some of those stats by saying that um, in the last federal election we raised, uh, GetUp raised more than in the previous election. Um, it was, I think, over $2 million um, and spent slightly more than that, which is a little bit worrying for my accountant. Um, and that um, a substantial amount of our donations come from people who donate over $10,000. Um, in fact, GetUp was founded by, um, by individuals who... Um, chipped in you know, contributions, some of them $100,000. Some unions chipped in $100,000. At the beginning of GetUp, this is how um, you know, organisations like GetUp and Amnesty and others get started. Um, and that's definitely not something that we're ashamed of. Um, but at the moment, the majority, that's, those large nations over $11,000 account for 20% of our revenue, and of, our, of the money coming in the door. And 80% of, of the money coming in the door for GetUp is through donations that are smaller than that. The average donation is about $65, uh, all counted, and the average, the average person who donates gives about $95 in the course of the year. Um, most of them not through annual subscriptions, but through a couple of regular donations. And so I think this is a really exciting way of doing politics. I'm really proud to work in an organisation that is funded in that way. And that's why I have um, a slightly different perspective about political donations and to Dr. Tam on a few issues. I agree um, 
however, that human right and that political donations and money politics is fundamentally a human rights issue, and that we do need to curtail or infringe some rights, the right to give unlimited amounts of money or to spend unlimited amounts of money in order to advance the rights um, of Australians overall. Um, but this, the central, the first point that I want to really dig into here is the assertion that Dr. Tan made about elections being about contestants. Elections are about contestants. Um, and therefore, we should treat contestants in one way and everybody else in a different way. Now, I fundamentally disagree. I think that elections are not about contestants at all. I think they're about us. I think they're about the voters. Every other point in the political cycle for three and a half years between elections is all about the politicians. Every day it's about the politicians. But during elections, for once, refreshingly, it's about us. And so I, I hesitate to embrace this idea that, that politicians essentially should be treated differently and should have rights to spend money and receive money during elections that ordinary citizens don't. Um, and this really impacts on the way that you view third parties. Now, third parties have traditionally been entities that are, that are somewhat singular and, and cohesive. Um, they have been unions <coughs> and corporations and lobby groups who represent certain interests. And I think that that is changing. I think the nature of the party is changing. And the politics is no longer actually about parties anymore. Um, the midterm elections in the US, which just wrapped up, um, the most uh, widely commentated uh, phenomena of them has been the Tea Party, um, which ended up being associated with Republicans, but could very well not have been. Could very well have been a non-party entity and was, for a very long time, a genuine kind of grassroots movement, although funded by huge donations from oil companies. Um, <laughs> but in a, more, in a, I think, more positive sense, um, elections are, are not so much about parties in Australia anymore. Um, Get Up is not a political party, and, and I don't think we're a third party in the way that they're traditionally conceived. It's about representing um, the interests, the ideas, and um, the contributions and views of, of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Australians. Which leads me to um, talk about membership. And Dr. Tam raised the point about what is membership of GetUp. Um, now, membership of a traditional third party, like a union, is a fairly easy to define thing. You pay a membership fee, you sign up, you are officially recognised as a member, that entails, you, that entails certain rights that you have. For example, uh, if you're a member of, of a corporation, voting for the board of that corporation. If you're a member of a union, other things, if you're a member of the Labour Party, you can attend some branch meetings and uh, good luck with that. Um, then we should get up as different because uh, we're not like a, a third party in that sense. Membership of GetUp is like being a member of a community. It's just that it's an online community. A membership of a community, if you're a member of your local community centre or, or a, your chess community or whatever, doesn't give you voting rights. Uh, it gives you a place at the table in, in a community of people. And it gives you some sway, but not all the sway, in, in saying where that goes. Um, and we view get, that get up as an online community in very much the same way. Um, and that means that you can't formally influence GetUp's agenda at all. But your, inf your informal power over GetUp's agenda is absolute um, as a community. Because unlike trade unions and, and other third parties and unlike political parties, uh, I can't and GetUp can't um, go and progress issues that GetUp members don't believe in. Um, if we, we launched a, an ad today about banking, um, attacking essentially banks for unfair practices, or what we say unfair practices. Essentially, we haven't campaigned on before. No GetUp member has, has voted for, for campaigning on this. Um, now, if we launch that ad and nobody donates to it, and it's not just if they disagree with it. If they don't tacitly consent and give money to it and get actively behind it passionately, then the whole thing falls apart. And we lose all the money we invested in making the ad, the campaign goes nowhere, and nothing happens. And if we do that for a couple of weeks, a couple of months in a row, then get up runs out of money and we cease to exist. So the, un, the informal power of get up members to influence our agenda is absolute in a way that it's not for, for any other organisation that I can think of because of political donations, because there is an immediacy um, with which the political donations of get up members affect what we do. Um, they enable everything that we do. And that's, just not, that's not just the case for, for fundraising, it's also the case for, for petitions and and for our human rights consultations where 10,000 GetUp members turned out to attend uh, meetings in each other's houses and living rooms and went to 
official consultations um, for election day where we didn't pay anybody um, but you know, 7,000 volunteers showed up and handed out leaflets and, and did other things on election day. So it's a, it's a different form of, of third party. It's, it's more like a community. Um, and therefore the way that we regulate third parties and the way that we regulate parties really has to move on from this kind of 20th century way of looking at, at parties as, as contained entities that can be regulated in certain ways. Now, to talk about how that actually works in practice, I'm going to move quickly to talking about, um, about spending loans, for example. Um, now, Dr. Tamar has a point that he's, he's a passionate advocate for spending limits and um, has raised a point with me in the, in the, in the past that uh, get up is not. In fact, we have a um, political donations campaign out there, there's a petition, there are ads, um, and none of them mention spending limits at all. We're about limits on donations. And the reason for that is um, that, not that I'm opposed to spending limits in any sort of passionate way, but more that I have no problem with with anybody spending money on politics. I have no problem with um, there being TV ads on air every commercial during the election campaign. I have no problem with that at all, it's provided it comes from democratic sources that give people power, uh, not huge corporations' power. I have a problem with the source of the donations. Um, I have a problem with those ads if they're paid for, and only if they're paid for by the super wealthy individuals who've contributed 500,000 or, or $5 million to run them, or by corporations um, who are donating huge amounts of money to political parties. And the vast majority of donations to political parties are from corporations. The source of the donations is my concern with it, not the amount of the donations. And that's why um, GetUp has been advocating for a limit on the source and the amount of donations rather than spending. Um, and what we would advocate for is that corporations should not be able to donate to political parties. Um, that we don't allow the corporations to vote, uh, The individuals are the, um, are the entities who participate in politics, and if you believe in a cause, if you believe in a politician you want to donate to them, then you should do it yourself. Not um, have your company donate $500,000. Um, so I'll, I'll move on from, from that, but to draw a line and say that I think there is a kind of philosophical difference about um, how politics is, is run and what aim we're, we're reaching for. And the aim that I think we should be reaching for when considering political reform um, is a system where people have more power um, over politicians. And uh, in, this, in the vein of Graham Richardson, whatever it takes to get people more power over their politicians and make those politicians more accountable is, I think, what we should aim for. So, the, the final point, and I'm sorry, I, I, I want to leave plenty of time for questions, um, that Dr. Tam raised that I want to talk about briefly is um, why these ideas about political nation reform are being accepted, why they're not, why we're not seeing progress on them. Um, and, I mean, the short answer, I think, is that um, people aren't giving enough political donations to <coughs> um, But there are other answers as well. The first is that we accept the transparency frame, the frame that... Um, that if we lower the transparency threshold, we know who's donating to our politician, that's okay. That's not okay. Um, we need to move beyond transparency and call out politicians who, who put forward transparency as an answer to this problem and tell them that it's not enough. It's not nearly enough. It just means that we'll be able to see their corruption or, or undue influence more than we would otherwise. Um, and the third is because I hate to, um, to disagree with, the human, with the, this idea that we should be talking about political relations as human rights idea, but... I think the third reason is that this has become a, an, this has become a cerebral issue um, where it should be um, a concrete issue. This has become about uh, human rights and, and policy where it should be about those blokes are bastards. And it should be about um, Woodside and it should be about Woodside um, pipelines in WA um, having land compulsorily acquired for their construction by the Western Australian Premier who receives donations from Woodside. It should be about um, gambling licences in New South Wales being given to the industries that donate hundreds of thousands of dollars to formerly the Labour Party, now they've switched to Barry O'Farrell because they can see the writing on the wall. It should be about those things. Um, it should be about real life instances where people have lost power over their politicians. And that's why, um, that's why GetUp doesn't talk about political donations as a human rights issue. 
although I think fundamentally, um, for those of us who, who are engaged in this space, it is. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there, um, except to say that, um, that um, despite all of, all of my, my quibbles, um, I, I think that you know, we are in a really exciting moment at the, right now where Gary Gray is being put in as a minister. We have this, this parliament that can really um, push for reform on this issue. And the thing that is holding us back more than anything else um, is that there's no cohesive uh, object that we're calling for. That the, those who are calling for political nations reform are split, and that allows the minister to get away with whatever he likes, whether that be transparency or limits on spending, which um, from my discussions with him is, is where he's heading. I think that limits on spending will probably, will probably eventuate this term of parliament. I'm disappointed that that's not going to be limits on donations as well. But I'll leave it. Thanks.
say that um, people, people have um, more, more influence over politicians, more power over politicians, but I'm just wondering which people have more power over politicians. Is it Simon and Shay who has more power? Because the, three, the 330 of us who sign a petition don't actually go and see the politicians. Oh, look, uh, I, I agree. There are grievous uh, problems in terms of democratic accountability in this country. I don't shy away from And in fact, a lot of my work is devoted to that. I completely agree. Yeah. That's a good answer. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> well, talk about specifics, but you know, I, I don't, there's nothing in my talk that actually says anything to the contrary. You know? So, uh, um, so to, to answer the second question you know, about um, who um, is gaining more power over politicians, um, it's it's true that um, you know organisations like GetUp and like any lobby group really um, need to focus power through um, certain channels um, in the same way that um, you know the uh, the kind of union movement um, decades ago. Um, you know, channeled workers' power through um, enterprise bargaining and, and through negotiators, um, and that's you know, that can get out of hand, um, and you can find that those that organisation that power structure breaks down, that channel doesn't become clear anymore. Um, I think that um, that the immediacy of the internet and the, the kind of setup that organisations like GitHub have um, on dependency on on membership, I mean that that channel is more open than it is in, in other models of, of campaigning. But it's always going to be the case that you know, Simon and Sheikh um, goes into a meeting with the minister. He's, he derives his power from, from the get members who are signed the petition, but it has to be a channel. The thesis of your talk was that, uh, well, one of the thesis that I took it was that um, uh, by implication is that there may be a direct correlation between the amount of money you spend uh, that, that's available to the political party and the influence that they have to, on the electorate. But that doesn't necessarily follow. I mean, you just have to look in America where in the Californian race, uh, Christine Whitman uh, spent about 100 and $30 million as against Jerry Brown who spent $30 million and she lost badly. And in elections where, say the last federal, uh, 2007 election, um, no matter, it was pretty obvious to all that uh, no matter how much money the coalition was throwing into the election, it was right from about eight months out likely to lose and in fact did lose. So, in a sense, applying um, controls and regulations on limiting money might, may not necessarily um, lead to the result you're hoping for, but would not be a problem that if you apply controls and regulations, you actually limit the ability for groups like the Greens or the or Get Up or any other equivalents to rise up and, and have uh, uh, through whatever issue that, that attracts the population have an ability to to, um, to make a mark. I'll respond to the last point first. I mean, uh, I, I support spending limits. So the spending limits basically operate in terms of a certain threshold, you can't spend beyond that. Yeah? So in terms of the last, the YouTube of people rising up, so people can still spend, they just can't spend, they just can't spend beyond a certain limit. So I think that really, if you're thinking about smaller groups and so on and so forth, the, those who are going to be more affected by spending limits are the big spenders. There is the major political parties or the money companies. They're not going to be the small players. They're going to be hit by spending limits. Now, in terms of a broader point, you're quite right. I mean, uh, there is no strict correlation between the amount spent and the level of amount of votes. Simply, one can understand it just abstractly why this is the case, because the thing is that... Uh, Voters are persuaded, or voters may cast their voting positions due to a range of reasons. 
including how many ads have bombarded it. Okay? So we can't say, you know, I, in fact, in my book, I strongly contest the proposition money buys elections because I think that there's such a neat uh, relationship that's actually not captured by the complexity in terms of the relationship between money and electoral outcomes. But having said that, yeah, having said that, it's clear that money is an important factor in terms of shaping electoral outcomes. It might not be a decisive influence, and that might vary according to context, but it's clearly an influence. You know, I always think about it, think about it as a hypothetical. If you ask, if we thought that money wasn't important, we say to the political parties, why don't you engage in a voluntary armistice? Why don't the political parties just say, we're going to spend, I'm going to spend five minutes, I know this is bad for the political system because, and I think that, hey, money doesn't make a difference. It's inconceivable. It's inconceivable political parties would voluntarily restrain their spending of money. And I think the last one I make about what you say is that, I mean, recall that when I advocated spending limits, you're right, I mean, one of the arguments is about fairness, and that fairness argument links, hinges upon some relationship between spending and electoral outcomes. But most important, not most importantly, equally important is the anti-corruption rationale. Political parties strongly believe money influences electoral outcomes, and they will sell excess 